Carlos is one of the leaders of RIAT, a Vienna-based organization, uh, and I would say very close one uh, in terms of values and program and intents uh, to Pearl Polis. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you came. And since Matthias is also a board member of Open Hardware Association, he's gonna present uh, uh, presentation about a uh, topic of hardware uh, security, trust, uh, and he's gonna uh, take a special uh, in, uh, insight into this uh, problematics uh, in terms of uh, recently uh, running months of open hardware. So we're gonna talk about uh, trust and verification and other security measures uh, in hardware we trust or do not. So, thank you, Matthias. Thank and you very much. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. <laughs> um, so, my talk is called The Past, Present and Future of Opt-Out with Open and Libre Hardware. And um, I want to relate this a little bit to this kind of um, ideas of crypto anarchy and how we can actually regain these certain things we might have lost already with hardware, with open hardware. Um, this all is also part of the Open Hardware Month, so we are now in the month of Open Hardware. Um, I will explain a little bit uh, initially what this is about, but first I want to give a brief overview of what I will be covering, what topics we will be covering today. Um, so we'll first contextualize a little bit, then I will give an introduction to Open Hardware. What is it? What is it for? Why do we need it? And also I will give a few examples, a few tangible examples on how we can use that to regain specific crypto-anarchic principles or attempts that we might have lost already if we don't do so. I will look um, and briefly explain also why uh, this is important and why open and libre hardware can help us in this regard. So, um, as I'm referring to a lot of different um, projects, and um, I'm always, as you uh, people know me also from last year, having a lot of hyperlinks in my presentation, um, I will also put these slides up uh, again this year on the Riot website, so remember riot.at slash hdcpp19. And um, I also want to point to three other talks I have been giving already in the past, uh, which are in this scope somehow. So there's one, on the one hand, um, the 30, uh, two C3 presentation on the Apertus Axiom open source cinema camera, which you can rewatch. All these things are on YouTube. Um, there was a Transmediale panel about future factories in 2016, where I have been participating, which is also in the context of my talk today. And more recently on MoneroCon 2019, I was, been, I was speaking um, about critical decentralization, open and libre hardware. So this is also related. So if you want to dig deeper, you can follow these uh, online links here. Um, the context of all this is actually um, me, first of all. I'm a research designer and a, pro a project developer. I'm working with the Riot Institute, uh, but also I'm, um, I'm one of the board members of the OSHA, of the Open Source Hardware Association. You can contact me if you're interested in any of these topics that we'll be covering today, especially if you're working with crypto and open hardware, because we will be also um, doing a lot of interviews and preparing a lot of documentation and, 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 and publications in this context. So, um, briefly to explain what Riot is, so we are an independent institute in Vienna, based in Vienna and Cyprus mostly, and, but we operate globally and we are working specifically with privacy technologies, with open hardware and with aspects of future decentralization. So, in a way, um, you can find most of the stuff online, so I don't want to, to cover everything here, but we are mo working mostly with um, um, documentation and with actual tangible outcomes such as publications. So, this is a recent publication that we also distributed here. Um, last year in the institute here as well, uh, and this was also um, for a longer time available in the Parallel Policy. This was the, the last issue of the Future Crypto Economics magazine. We are continuing developing this, and um, the next issue will be about open hardware. Um, this is a, um, an older book actually, but still very, very relevant. I was going through the, the aspects of it and again rereading everything, and we covered maybe 10% of all the open hardware interviews we have been doing with a lot of open hardware practitioners in order to find out what are the motivations, why are the open sourcing things that are usually kept private. So in um, technology, in open source culture, um, especially in hardware, you have a lot of intellectual property rights and not so many 
things are open, as you would guess, and as you would know. So this book will also be um, in a special edition um, given out and handed out tomorrow, because we will be also hosting a workshop tomorrow uh, together with Riddle and Code. So um, there will be a few more uh, left. So if someone is interested, please contact us after the talk. Um, yeah, as I was saying, there's the October Open Hardware Month, which is happening right now. And what does that actually mean? So it means um, the Oshawa is organizing worldwide events, but not only Oshawa, individuals, hackerspaces, people that work in the field of open hardware. And they're also communicating, documenting, and making this all a topic, explaining what is happening, explaining why they open source, and also trying to um, um, explain about the specific projects. There's the uh, OHM 2019 hashtag on Twitter, where you can follow what is going on globally. And in case you are um, from a hardware background or you have some event, you can still post Post this online, so there's an ongoing list and growing list of international events happening there. Um, I want to briefly also explain what the OSHWA is, the Open Source Hardware Association. So um, I won't go through all the details here that are listed here, but this is the core um, um, uh, purposes and activities of the OSHWA uh, to, to all the, uh, organize conferences, to educate the general public, and to um, collect, compile, and publish data on the open source hardware movement. But um, in a way also to document what is going on. It's a quite complex topic, and I will briefly explain also why this is the case. So um, this is maybe um, a very tangible thing that you can um, browse through um, about the Oshawa or from the Oshawa. It's the certification website. There's a lot of different open source, um, certif open source hardware association certified projects online there. Um, it's a directory online, and you can see um, a lot of different projects. Also, some of them I will be speaking about today. Um, another very important thing is um, there is the Open Source Hardware Summit or Open Hardware Summit, which is happening every year. And uh, this year it's not happening, so this is why we have the Open Hardware Month. But um, this is a very important uh, next year's event because this will be the 10th anniversary of the Open Source uh, of the Open Hardware Summit, which will be uh, taking place in, in New York. So you can already um, um, get tickets and reserve tickets for that. The, it's already uh, booking out very fast. <laughs> So um, I want to more specifically also contextualize this whole talk and everything we are doing here at HCPP with something that we branded the Open Hardware Dialogues. And um, I'm calling it, or we are calling it Dialogues because we found out it's a very good method for us uh, in order to learn and to understand and to, to learn about new projects and also to communicate. So um, it's a very discursive um, 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 way also of our um, whole events that we are organizing. So that means we are collecting a lot of um, um, knowledge and a lot of um, um, content that we will be publishing at a later stage. You can find the current program always on writeit slash open hardware because there's a lot of things also that we are coming up with a little bit last minute. So um, a little bit here the details. Um, so at ACPP itself, there will be um, a few meetings and meetups uh, uh, today, I think is one, and tomorrow. We will have a small exhibition also, um, which is at a hidden location, not disclosed yet. Um, and then we will continue also to Japan Blockchain Week, where there will be an additional program, which is not entirely released right now. So the whole open hardware dialogues thing will then be concluded with the C3, with the uh, annual uh, Chaos Communication Congress, where, where we will be publishing some, some material and some uh, small uh, uh, print release. And then there will also be a larger release at the Open Source Hardware Summit in New York in 2020. But now to my actual talk, which is called The Past, Present, and Future of Opt-Out with Open and Libre Hardware. And I want to actually start this with the question, and I'm not sure if everyone understands what open hardware means, and to be more precise, what open source hardware means. And in a way, why this is, what's the problem? Why do we need open hardware? What is this for? And um, I'm always starting because I think this is a right and very interesting uh, publication, very, uh, has been put already very precisely by Jonathan Citrain, who was basically um, pinning down the fact that consumers have been shifting from generative to tethered technologies. This is how um, Citrin describes it. And um, what does he mean with these tethered appliances or tethered uh, technologies? So in a way, our hardware gets less and less repairable. You can um, interact with the hardware much less than you could in the previous days or in the previous decades. And in, in a way, this was a, a key principle or a key idea behind hardware for a long time. So if we look, for example, at personal computers and how this whole um, idea of a personal computer started, um, it was actually delivered um, to be assembled by the people at home. So you would receive some kind of um, a mail order package, you would assemble the computer yourself, and you would be automatically tinkering with it because you can assemble it in a different way, you can 
created in a different way, you can extend it. So this kind of ex extendability, repairability was a key principle of hardware back in the days. So um, this is also relevant um, in terms of cryptography because this microcomputing revolution, as um, here Arvin Naranjanan puts it, um, was actually also relevant because it, it brought back all these kind of ideas that we find in these ideas of the cypherpunks of, of crypto anarchy. So we had encryption for the first time publicly available, which was actually computable at home and not at mainframes. So this is why microcomputers have been, uh, and the microcomputing revolution was super relevant for this whole movement we have now. But at the same time, the devices that we have these days don't, uh, any, don't look and don't feel like this kind of original um, devices of the microcomputing revolution. So um, we remember how that turned out um, after the microcomputing revolution. So we had the crypto wars of the 90s where um, people smuggled out the RSA source code on T-shirts and so on. This is an old story. We know it all. And um, in a way, to conclude the first point I want to make, um, closed devices reduce technological literacy. So we learn less about these devices we have these days. Um, and this is actually how Citrain puts it, this kind of problem with tethered devices. So you're basically locked in into specific hardware. On the example of the iPhone, you cannot even replace the battery yourself without maybe destroying the device or at least voiding the warranty of it. Um, and at the same time, you don't know what is going on. You cannot control it. You cannot verify it. It's, it's a big problem, especially from this kind of crypto anarchic ideals that we hopefully have. So um, you cannot repair them. It's, it's, it's actually a lose-lose, it's a win-lose situation after all. So um, this, this idea of this right of, to repair is currently very much debated. And um, uh, I'm also pointing here to this repair org movement. It's a very strong debate that is going on in the US right now. Um, and I suggest you, you uh, check this out as well, because it's also having a huge, enormous economic effect if, if um, 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 information about um, devices would be available not only to the manufacturers. So to give you another example, like there is specific hardware that can only be repaired by, by the manufacturers, which is, in my opinion, a problem, because you have a third party you're trusting, you cannot re repair this yourself. And ideally, all documents is available to a lot of people that um, people can create um, um, rip, can rip, uh, small repair shops or so it has a definite uh, definitely a, um, economic aspect as well so in a way also though repairing is a way of regaining uh, knowledge so um, as soon as you are um, touching those devices and trying to repair them you learn a little bit about these devices. So this, can, this, this, this knowledge, this repair knowledge, um, is very essential to hardware development or to hardware knowledge. So in a way, um, reverse engineering also is a very important step. And that means um, you have to understand what kind of hardware you have. So um, um, that, that means repairing it could be a first step to regain this kind of technological literacy. Um, this is a very good um, uh, book, and I'm a big fan also of Andrew Bani Huang, who is um, um, explaining this also very good uh, in his book, The Hardware Hacker. And he explains um, different stories on how to reverse engineer different approaches. So this is a very good starting point for someone who wants to uh, dig deeper into hardware reverse engineering. It's a very recommended book. Um, Interestingly also, uh, um, and I love uh, actually what, what, what uh, Bunny says here, without the right to think and explore, we risk becoming enslaved by technology, and the more we exercise the right to hack, the harder it will be to take that right away. So um, it's, in my opinion, super important to also um, make sure that um, um, device hacking, opening devices, checking what kind of hardware you receive from a verifiability perspective, but also from an from a, um, educational perspective is an integral thing. It shouldn't be taken away from you. So there is still attempts to make sure that you cannot um, repair or open or uh, um, um, kind of disassemble specific devices such as cars. And it's always considered sometimes a security principle that it's not repairable. It's a good thing. In my opinion, it's a very bad thing because you lose the, the um, a property actually to verify what you actually got. Um, open hardware in this context can actually help regain this literacy. And uh, here's actually, um, um, I took this uh, a quote also from this kind of official definitions of open hardware. So um, because there's not only the device itself um, verifiable, but you have specific properties of the device, such as the drawings, the schematics, the design, the material, the PCB layout data, all of this is like open source. So you don't only learn about how your device works, and you don't learn only how to validate it, but you can learn the, the, the craft and the skill that is needed to, in order to produce devices themselves. 
So um, there's a very good start for people that are not so deep into the open hardware um, topic. Um, this is um, called Building Open Source Hardware, and it's uh, written and edited by Alicia Gibb and, and et al. <laughs> and um, I want to here also point to a very interesting in uh, article which explains the difference between open hardware and open software a little bit, because it's not the same thing. So you cannot compare it. It's an entirely different uh, domain in a way. So we have um, the fact, and Michael Weinberg states this in his, uh, in his text in this book, that hardware is born open. So that means um, while open hardware or while software with GPL and CC licenses can be um, secured in a way or you, you can basically control it more granularly, it's, it's a different story with, with hardware because it's actually falling under patent law, which means it's considered something useful or um, things that do stuff. Um, on the other hand, um, um, Code and everything falls under artistic premises, so that means it's considered artistic work. I, I find that always interesting because you have to, uh, so art cannot be useful, or what's, what's the problem with our society? So this is an in interesting aspect, but from a legal perspective, this is the problem. So it's like not that easy to, to, um, to make sure that um, nobody basically violates a specific rights that you want to, to give a specific product. So um, the way how this is usually done in open hardware is trademarks. So a very good example in this context is the other Arduino, which is a trademark, and then, then everything else is released, and there's a lot of Arduino clones, but people would actually remember the trademark, that you cannot use the Arduino trademark on your own um, product. There's also specific licenses for this, uh, to, to tackle this specific problem with open hardware, or with actually that you save your, or, or fine granularly make sure that, uh, how is it actually used, which is the Tapper license. It's a kind of older license than um, very famous one is the Sun open hardware license. There's the version two currently drafted. This is online as well if someone is interested, and GPL um, V3 is also sometimes um, used in the context of open hardware designs. So um, here's a very good um, quote also from Richard Stallman, who is explaining uh, basically the same facts that I have just outlined. So that, um, he explains what is the problem, why is this not so easy solvable, and this is also a chapter in our book, um, Openism Conversations in Open Hardware. So um, open source hardware works differently than open source software, and there are a lot of new challenges that get introduced, and we have to face them somehow when we are designing a product or project. So I want to give a few examples because it might not be tangible yet. So a um, very good example, in my opinion, are wireless routers. And um, this was a very important router in terms of like open source movement because it's um, um, the Linksys uh, WRT54G, uh, which is said to be the best-selling router of all times. And um, actually, um, this is important because the open WRT uh, firmware was actually running on this computer and could have been developed because there was a lot of information about the hardware available. So it was um, licensed also partly under the GNU general public license firmware we're talking. And um, in a way, this actually also was showing that um, it was a good attempt because we have a lot of um, um, developments and the open WRT is only one of the alternative firmware you can use on routers. And this is a very good example, in my opinion, also because we can see all the arguments I will be giving in this talk on, on one uh, kind of category of products, which is routers in this case. So you might be um, familiar with the Tourist Omnia open hardware router. It's also a very interesting pro uh, project. So this is basically um, also only made possible because we had this initial reverse engineering and availability of the source code of the Linksys. And um, a maybe more radical approach would be then the Libre CMC, which is a Libre firmware. So basically, this runs on a very limited amount of devices only um, because um, the, the attempt of Libre approaches versus open is that you have um, no binary blobs in the drivers, so you can actually also make sure that the software and the drivers are not having any backdoors or any other information that you cannot verify. Um, Another example is cameras. There's a long tra tradition in hacking cameras because usually people are restricted in what they can do with their cameras. Technically, though, a camera sensor is, can be used for still photography or for video photography. So um, this is a very interesting project, the uh, CHDK Canon Hack Developer Kit, which was actually a, a, a community-run project on trying to reverse engineer Canon cameras, like very simple Canon cameras for photography use, or for like extended use for photography. A more popular approach was the Magic Lantern project. Maybe it's more um, uh, well-known already, um, which um, basically enabled p 
people that were filming with um, these Canon-based cameras, um, DSLR cameras, um, to use an individual firmware that was giving them basically pro usage for uh, that you, you would usually have only in very expensive cameras. So it's, in my opinion, also a very important project. And then this would be like the most radical approach, um, also a project we have been working with and I have been also presenting at the C3, the Apertus Open Source Cinema Camera, which is a completely open hardware camera. So that means like every part is as open as it's possible. So in this case, I won't go into the details. You can see the talk online, but the idea is here that you can basically modulate or like control extend and so on the software and the hardware at maximum um, liberating force, so to say. So um, I want to here actually propose three different opt-out possibilities that we have with open hardware today. So the first would be to actually open up the hardware through reverse engineering in order to verify. That means um, in a specific security setting, but also um, for our own sake and not to be paranoid here, but there's a lot of um, hardware implants, of course, existing in devices. Um, this would be an opt-out, basically. Another opt-out, in my opinion, is to create alternative firmware, and I will give a tangible example uh, in a second. Um, to add features that the hardware that didn't have in the first place. In order, I mean, if you take this from a radical perspective, you could also even, um, in my opinion, create a future opt-out society by complete, completely decoupling your information and communication methods um, with hardware. And the third part being to create open source hardware yourself. This is a long and, and a very long task. And also, as we see, as we saw on the Apertus open source cinema camera can take years. So in the example of the camera, this took uh, over 12 years to have a first functioning program there, project there. So the problem though is what I maybe hopefully explained uh, uh, in a way that people <laughs> could understand, this tethering of, of, of these ecosystems is a big problem. So um, it's not only hardware which is tethered, it's, it's not only that you cannot repair your, your hardware anymore, it's also the problem that the software cannot be changed. So this is due to, some, due to the fact that the, the manufacturers want to uh, keep you in this kind of end-to-end -end situation where you're using all sorts of um, um, ways um, that they can actually uh, profit on, on any step that you're using their hardware. So hardware usually comes bundled with software. It's no way that you, um, without reverse engineering, can uh, install your own firmware. There are a few examples, though, that I will show in a second. And, and usually the problem and the limitation is that there's no documentation about it. You have to do a lot of work, and um, usually for the regular person, it's too much work. So uh, enter device liberation alternative firmware is a huge a huge field and a huge culture, and I just picked a few examples to show you why this is important, where it works in my opinion. So usually you start with um, having some kind of um, 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 hardware that actually analyzes the, any part or every part of the, of the hardware you want to look at. So this is a very famous one, it's the bus pirate, which actually has specific properties that you can actually find out, okay, what is the device, what is the protocol here at stake, what is the, how is the device communicating with my computer, how is it communicating at all, and so I can actually a little bit find out more about the device. This is a more less or less known uh, device, which in my opinion is a little bit better than the bus pirate. So in case you're doing reverse engineering, take a look at this. Um, it's the Shakira, it's called, and you can find this on. And it's a lot of information about this device. It helps you with all this kind of pitfalls because usually people start to build the Arduino breadboard thingy, and there's a lot of other things, and it will be slow. So there's a few existing devices where you can actually speed up the process in reverse engineering. Um, alternative firmwares to create this kind of um, secure and unmonitored communication um, as envisioned by the cypherpunks and as, as um, also mentioned in this uh, crypto anarchic manifesto is um, um, regainable in my opinion by reverse engineering and by regaining the control over devices. And I want to give here a very tangible example. I mean, nobody worked on this. Um, there's a huge community that worked on, on this project, but I think this could be extended. We could use this already, and if someone is like up for some hardware hacking, then this is a very good uh, thing to start. So this is a very cheap um, walkie-talkie uh, handset. So you can basically um, um, communicate with people over FM on over, over different um, um, technologies, and basically um, this is a Chinese knockoff thingy. It's like 120 bucks. And you can buy this, it's by Travis Goodspeed and all, and it's online on GitHub. 
And the good thing, it's cheap. It runs already alternative firmware, so you don't have to reverse engineer it. There's a community of 60 or 80 people already reverse engineered the whole thing, and it's easy to build upon. So what comes to mind is, for example, to create some channel hopping, pri public private key, SMS uh, function on this thing, or also to extend it with some other communication system. But this would be like a an, an, an non-internet usable communication system of the cypherpunks, theoretically. It's very advanced. You should really take a look. Uh, this is another good example because I like it because it's such an easy hack. So there is the, the Osmo FL2K um, processor, which can be used um, for multiple applications. So um, this is a completely documented chip, and um, it's basically um, easy usable for software-defined radio. Basically, you can do a lot of things with software-defined radio because you can create everything that sends things and tra transmits things. Um, it's just limited on the, on the amplifiers and other hardware parts you use, but basically it's a very good starting point. And the good thing about this is it costs five dollars. So there's also uh, already a, a huge community ab around this, this hardware. And the interesting thing is um, this comes mostly in this kind of USB 3 VGA adapters. So you, um, there's a few in interesting buying guidelines online how you can actually find them. You can spot them on eBay for maybe cheaper even than $5. The interesting thing is you could easily build with this, for example, your own um, DVB-T uh, pirate radio or video or television station or something. You could spoof uh, a GSM. Um, base stations in a second, you can do some man in the middle attack. Uh, it's a very good um, um, systems penetration tool as well. In my opinion, it's a very good starting point. There's a vast amount of documentation on and about this device. So um, I want to give you also some two other examples where open hardware actually helped with specific opting out of specific elements that were in a way not verifiable or uh, that solve specific elements of verifiability or centralization that come with all with device centralization. So basically, we are trusting a lot into Apple or specific manufacturers in that they give us the devices that they don't, they don't introduce backdoors into the hardware and software. So th there's two very interesting examples which I identified which explain a little bit better why I think open hardware makes sense in this context. So one um, uh, project that I think is really interesting is the Safecast um, organization. They started a crowd science Geiger counter, which was called, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this, B Geigi or something. Um, it's on safecast.org and it um, basically looked like this. And it's a Geiger counter, so you can actually um, make sure to, you can identify ra radiation levels. And this was actually used um, in order to verify the information that was given out, out uh, after the Fukushima incident in Japan. So people would actually crowdsource this information, would, would actually crowdsource what they are measuring, and then would make this data available. And there, were, um, there was different researchers who, first of all, had access to this data, and secondly, uh, could actually then compare this information to the information that has been given out by the government, which was different, to be honest. This is all evident now, and we can see how there has been misinformation uh, going on. And it's a very easy example how you can basically opt out of this information uh, asymmetries. Basically, you are creating your own truth, you are um, designing your devices, and then you can actually fact-check the situation. Um, another very, very interesting example, um, and this is a talk that uh, um, was given on the 34 C3, which is called Vintage Computing for Trusted Radiation Measurements and a World Free of Nuclear Weapons. Um, it's a very interesting talk. I can strongly suggest to see the talk. Um, but this is also interesting from a cypherpunk perspective. I mean, not that I'm saying like we have possibly an, a nuclear war. Hopefully not. But the problem is that um, there's a specific problem to solve in, uh, related to trust that you have with disarming uh, nuclear um, um, uh, warheads. And the problem is, in order to disarm, you need to confirm the authenticity of these warheads. They have an individual, unique radiation uh, signature. And the problem is that um, um, this information and most of the validation that is needed in order to disarm it in involves multiple parties to say, okay, this is the correct warhead, and it's actually, and now we're disarming it. So in, you need as a specific time, a lot um, um, of simultaneous verification. And the problem here starts that, let's say, we have, a, I don't know, five large parties that have nuclear warheads and they, and they have some certain uh, kind of understanding how to disarm, you have to make sure that a certain party A and party B has um, hardware that can be trusted at the same time. So ideally, these people create their own hardware. 
And this is where um, um, open hardware comes into play. It's a very good, interesting scenario. It's a very speculative scenario because, due to my knowledge, nobody yet uses um, open hardware to disarm. But we should disarm. Maybe open hardware can help there. Um, and this paper basically um, solves and tackles a lot of these questions and um, has open hardware as the answer in order to disarm nuclear warheads. So um, interesting choice on hardware was the Apple II board. Why? did they choose this kind of vintage board? Because it's completely documented. It's very easy to verify. You basically can't, can't do anything wrong. Um, it would be accessible on after, after sale markets. So let's say in, you would get it in China. You would get it in, in, uh, in any part of the world. The problem might be, OK, Apple could have built in some kind of uh, backdoor back then. But it's, it's so verified that you can easily measure every part of this, of, of this board. And um, so this original Apple II was extended with a few custom-designed open hardware elements that would be needed for this nuclear disarmament. And these are like new produced uh, hardware modules for the Apple II. So um, another hint to a possible project would be, um, why don't we use these sorts of devices, these verifiable devices, to create keys? We are all using like very uh, new hardware, on the example of even the crypto hardware wallets that are um, there might be backdoors in the chips. There's, there's even um, basically documented uh, backdoors in the, in the chips. So why don't we use like, um, hardware like that to create our, our master keys or something like that? So there's a lot of applications, in my opinion, from a cypherpunk perspective or from a crypto market perspective, where we can actually, um, uh, we could not look at new devices, but look at vintage devices that could actually help then in order to, to, to recreate the trust. So um, the solution would be to use vintage, verifiable hardware in uh, combination, there's a typo I found, um, with open source hardware. That's, that's always good. So the verifiability is good. But also open source hardware doesn't mean that um, the components are always verifiable. So I would have to extend this by saying verifiable open hardware. Um, what is the relevance to crypto enthusiasts in this context? And this is um, because I, I would say most of you are crypto enthusiasts. Um, Hardware ram num uh, random number generators is a good example. So um, it's randomness. This is a huge topic. It's a large debate. And I don't want to go into the details. And I don't want to debate about it. But um, uh, I'm a big fan of hardware number generators. I have, um, I'm collecting them. I, I love them. It's amazing. And um, here's just a few of them, which I also find like visually appealing. Um, this is a, a maybe more interesting one, in my opinion, because it's a Libre hardware. But what is Libre hardware and um, what is open hardware? So again, if we look at the router um, firmwares. Um, it's ideal if you have um, um, verifiable open source hardware and if you have also software that doesn't run any binary code on it, binary blobs, so to say. So you can actually check, okay, is the software possibly having a backdoor? No. Is the hardware having a backdoor? No. And basically the problem still and the, the limit is the hardware because um, there's very, very few um, undocumented or, or there's very few fully documented um, 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 chips out there. So for example, to give you a context, in most modern day um, CPU we have um, we have um, um, a Minix operating system which is started. You, uh, there could be uh, all sorts of things. That, while there wouldn't be um, kind of large data, data exploits possible, there could always be like metadata leakage, for example. And this is a problem, especially if we look at like privacy-driven cryptocurrencies where you secure the complete um, uh, software stack, but then the hardware is the is the weak point. And this is a big problem in my opinion. So. Entering hardware wallets, well, this is of course also a problem because this is, um, and I picked those three different hardware wallets uh, out of a reason. They have a very, very different um, trust approach. So um, on the left hand, we see the Trezor, which is an open source hardware which is verifiable because I can actually check, okay, what what is built there? I can rebuild it. I can run it on another device. Basically, it's 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 using standard components, so I can completely verify it. In the middle, we have the Bitbox, which is partially open only because it uses open source software, but has an uh, HSM. So I have to trust a hardware security module. So I have to trust the manufacturer of the hardware security model that there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and on the on the right hand side, you see the ledger, which is completely closed. So this is like very interesting to see. Are we really happy with these devices? Me personally, I'm only happy with the with the left one. And the problem is still, okay, do I trust ARM enough for the specific um, implemented chip? So I would love to have an Apple II to host all my keys, to be honest, just saying. Um, at least with the Trezor, we have the opportunity to build our own devices around this hardware. So that's already a step forward, in my opinion. And to conclude this, 
what I have been showing you in this, in this uh, kind of uh, marathon. So um, I was actually arguing that open hardware, creating open hardware would be also po a potential opt-out possibility, but it is hard. You cannot really create hardware yourself so fast. It's a lot of knowledge you need to know. This knowledge has been, or this potential has been taken away from us by actually closing down hardware much more. So um, a good start is to learn and to really reverse engineer and to take apart the things you have uh, lying around at home or, at, or in the office. Um, in this context, I want to also refer to a um, project and workshop that will be taking place here at uh, HTTP. It's the Blescomat. Uh, it's a kind of a reverse engineering of an open source build count of a, of a build counting machine in order to figure out how to use this potentially for the Lightning Network. It's in order to create a Lightning Network ATM. Um, it's a very interesting project. I was uh, talking with the creators also. And um, also the development is easier when you use in your designs um, existing uh, fully documented uh, components. So on the example of the Fresco Logic FL2000 chip that I was pointing out before, that is in most of this kind of USB 3 VGA adapters, um, this is a good starting point because you can, it's, there's a huge community behind it and it's very documented. So it's also an easier way to learn, easier way to start. Um, in situations where you have to verify and where this is actually crucial for your organization or where this is crucial for you because you're storing a lot of bitcoins on your devices, you should use the specific components as part of your design. It's, it's crucial in my opinion. And in, especially in zero trust situations, as we saw with the nuclear disarming, it's a kind of a different uh, scenario even. So um, here we have to possibly um, make sure that we find alternatives so we can actually verify the hardware again. So um, f um, especially also what I was pointing out here, this um, um, alternative crowdsourced um, a radiation counter, it's interesting to see that these kind of projects also work. I was um, thinking that this is a, is a problem and that people would not rebuild this, but this is a, a lot of people are using these kind of devices. So this is also important to understand that we can solve other issues by understanding and relearning and, and regaining this knowledge that has been taken away from us. So um, in a way, and maybe I didn't argue this enough, um, open and verifiable hardware can help to create the crypto anarchic principles, but also to, to somehow not completely give up on all these kind of ideas of the zero trust society, because um, I, while I like the approaches and while I'm also criticizing this on some other ends, I think we have to um, investigate what this kind of hardware and these available technologies offer us, what they can, what they can help us create. And, um, these devices are still missing. There's not, not a single device out there that completely functions where people are uh, communicating um, really secure and unmonitored as envisioned in this crypto manifesto. So these devices would have still to be built. So I hope um, someone actually takes on these ideas I'm, I was just presenting. So again, also to stress the fact about the Libre hardware debate. I don't know if you're not so familiar with it. Please take a look. It's a very huge debate online. So um, there's even a... Um, so that, um, a, a program actually from the FSF, Free Software Foundation, which specifically um, um, rates hardware or, or um, basically tells you which kind of hardware is more Libre than others. So there's a large list online where there's existing hardware that you can use. So if you are in, in working in cryptography or working with, with uh, um, sensible, sensitive data, then you should take a look at this list and uh, comprise your hardware stack or like, uh, make sure that your hardware stack uh, is comprised of these elements. Um, so usually um, um, in, in kind of hardware security situ situations or in on like uh, high trust situations, people would use, for example, this kind of old hardware. The problem is this is the last hardware that is verifiable from a mobile perspective or like a, a, a portable perspective. It's uh, um, the ThinkPad X200 is super old. I'm also using this, this uh, myself, but the problem is it's, it's slow, so you can use only very limited graphical features. But the problem is um, um, how far do we want to um, uh, bring the whole verifiability? Um, in my opinion, um, there is also the problem because a lot of people are um, looking at purism right now. While I love what they are doing, and I think they're a very important uh, um, addition to the, this whole security and privacy debate, um, all the hardware, and especially the CPUs they are using, uh, are showing us a lot of different uh, exploits. 
it's not that it's not Purism's fault at all. It's actually an Intel problem. So we see in all the uh, recent Spectrum meltdown and so on incidents that are ongoing. That um, this is just the beginning. You cannot really fix this with a software update. This is actually part of the hardware. So you're basically fucked <laughs> in a way. Um, so um, there's a lot of side channel attacks. There's a lot of. It's always the same um, kind of security problems that we have with these devices. So um, while I think. Purism is going into the right direction. We are not at the level of verifiable hardware at all right now. And this, is, this has to be solved. We have to solve this, this. Yeah, thank you so much for my talk. Thank you. I completely oh. don't know how I'm time-wise because I'm, I'm so concentrated. <laughs> so uh, I'm not you, you are in for, time. Yeah. We still have uh, even time for questions and there is one raised. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, basically, it follows from your talk that there are three levels of hardware where it can be opened. Basically, it is chip itself, which is integrated circuit, the assembly of the board with the multiple chips potentially, and the firmware. Can you just a bit elaborate on the because I assume that the chips are the hardest part of the story. Is there any way to verify that an actual chip is corresponding to the open documentation? And how the chip can, chips themselves can be open hardware? I mean, yeah, very good question, thank you. Um, basically, this is an ongoing debate as well, and we are on the verge of um, having uh, open silicon, which is uh, in its kind of beginnings. Um, some people might know um, that um, Risk V and all this kind of um, different kind of really open silicon that is on the verge of being like released. Currently, we are in the state that a lot of this proprietary hardware is really not verifiable. This is true. So um, a lot of these, um, um, so there could be potential other backdoors we don't know about. This is a very good point, and um, we have to still work around that. Uh, our technology is not far enough, but in the future, and we will see this very soon, hopefully, uh, we will have um, um, very cheap available RISC-V um, cores, open silicon, that you can completely uh, uh, verify yourself. Until then, we have to work around that, and we have to use old and vintage uh, machinery in order for our cryptographic context. It's a problem, especially in, in cryptography or in like very, um, in, in a way, this is, is also a reason um, um, why specific um, there's hardware limitations and, and the whole crypto economy, crypto economic principles are working around hardware limitations. The whole cryptography is based on that there's not a quantum computer available. In recent news, we saw also that there might be potential speed ups in specific things that we're building our security model around. This might be around the corner, we don't know, but as soon as we cannot verify the bare hardware we're using, I think we are even more attackable. Hello, thanks for your talk. Um, <clears throat> on the topic of vintage hardware, there was a recent announcement of a Cubes OS uh, certified uh, Lenovo ThinkPad X230 mm -hmm. that runs Core Boot. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's at least a bit more modern than the X200. Uh, what do you think about it? Um, there's a lot of debate about Core Boot or Libre Boot, and um, I mean, Core Boot has its specific limitations, and um, you will see all the debates online. I don't want to judge here, but um, there's a lot of um, interesting team members at the Core Boot team, just to say the least. You have to look it up yourself. Thank you. And another question? Okay. I really like what you're doing, um, and so I don't want this question to be misconstrued as like not really into it. Um, but like short term, from a pragmatic approach, is there a group of people looking at how do we uh, sidestep these issues? So, for instance, I think the Purism project they have like the microphone kill switch. Um, what is in the same vein as that? Because that seems like eminently doable, and maybe there's ways that we can sort of trick or step around uh, what we perceive as barriers? It depends on which devices you're looking at, but um, I would say um, privacy and specifically this privacy awareness is a huge market. So there's not only Purism, there's a lot of other projects as well. So Linux phones are very, um, are, are coming. There's a lot of prototypes out there. They're not super developed, but Purism is really doing a good step in the right direction. It's, uh, I think that I'm amazed how fast they were actually producing their product. 
Also, um, last year at the HCPP, there was Todd Weaver giving a talk about the Purism system. I really like what they're doing, um, but it depends on what kind of hardware you, we are looking at. So there's, of course, attempts in um, specific cryptographic hardware or like hardware wallets where that should be made like more open. I, I, I would say these kind of things exist in every sector. You just usually don't um, really see it because they don't have this kind of huge PR budget and they don't have um, a lot of advertising, but there's a lot of projects out there. So usually in this kind of enthusiast communities, you find a lot of projects like that. Um, especially, I mean, to, end, uh, to, to, to really reach end users, this is, this is a tough thing. You need a lot of, um, to, to raise a lot of money, you need to put a lot of money in your hand to have like a, a huge PR budget. But there are a lot of projects out there. I don't know where to start even, um, there's a lot of them. Okay, we still got questions. Uh, thank you for your talk, Kenan. Um, I was wondering um, if not FPGAs would be the best candidate, you know, for a hardware which is so a chip which is uh, you can use it you can program anything on it so the problem if you have the HDL uh, mm -hmm. description uh, you cannot trust the manufacturer that he does not temper the HDL yeah also true I mean the problem is like what what are we um, talking about um, because this, this this would be like a very specific use case where you can use an FPGA um, um, usually people want to use operating systems like Android or Linux or something on devices this is like a, uh, where purism steps in for example so this is actually soft in specific things where we just want to create uh, keys or solve specific issues then we can of course use specialized hardware although that it's always introducing another risk or any another unverified viability into the game so I, I didn't get into detail about that but it's a very good question why don't we use and look um, at other implementations or other technologies at all I don't, I don't know why actually I mean you can <clears throat> you can uh, there's nothing that uh, uh, stops you to program uh, you know x86 uh, compatible instructions that CPU mm -hmm. on an FPGA Yes, very good point. So then you just have to verify the FPG and if the FGB is verified, I mean under microscope, whatever, then you can do anything on it. Very good, let's do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Some other questions, please? If not so, thank you very much, Matthias.